Today, we're talking about suture safety outside the operating room. You will learn about the incidence of needle stick injuries, understand techniques, how to reduce needle stick injuries, and how to become more proficient in safe suturing techniques. This study from 2008 shows where most of the injuries occur, the operating room, patient rooms, procedure rooms, intensive care, and the emergency department. The surgeons in the study did a good job at reducing the highest incidence of needle stick injuries in the operating room. The surgeons focused on education and an awareness to reduce needle stick injuries using a hands-free technique and blunt needles. In the hands-free technique, no two surgical personnel touch the same sharp object simultaneously. The sharp object is put on a tray and the tray is passed from person to person. This significantly reduced needle sticks by about 59%. The second thing that they did was to convert sharp needles to blunt needles. We always thought that the needles had to be sharp. Not true, especially for a fascia and muscle. However, blunt needles are good for fascia and muscle, but not useful in skin and soft tissue. Needle stick injuries could be reduced if we sutured less often. In fact, not all wounds need to be closed. A number of wounds should be left open. These include wounds with retained foreign bodies, tendon lacerations, severe contamination, missing tissue, and bites. Sometimes the foreign body needs to be removed in the operating room. An orthopedic surgeon or hand surgeon may choose to take a patient with a tendon laceration to the operating room for repair. Wounds that are grossly contaminated and have a high risk for infection are left open and closed by secondary intention. Some of these wounds may be taken care of in the operating room where the surgeon can properly debride the wound before closing. Wounds that have a large amount of missing tissue are difficult to close. These wounds can be left and at a later date closed or revised. Most bite wounds are not closed because of the high risk of infection and should be left open. Gloves are our initial barrier to blood and bodily fluid exposure. There is a high frequency of perforations. 14% of them will have unrecognized glove perforation. Most of the needle stick perforations are located in three areas, the index finger, the thumb, and the palm. These locations can be reinforced to reduce exposures. Another means to deal with perforations is double gloving or using reinforced gloves. Studies have found that there is a 19% perforation rate for the outer glove and a 6% perforation rate of the inner glove. Wearing two gloves reduces penetration into the skin by 70 to 78%. While there is some concern about the loose fit of the glove, most agree that the benefits far outweigh these objections. It may be beneficial to add something between the two gloves. One manufacturer places a strong antiviral diluted hypochlorite solution between the layers of the glove. An 81% reduction in transmission of virus was found with the use of these gloves. For many years, protective devices were put on over the gloves to reduce the possibility of getting cut. A knitted outer glove, chain link under gloves, Kevlar, stainless steel, synthetic fibers, and protective shields are examples of these protective devices. These protective devices work great for scalpels, but not for needle sticks. There is a concern of a greater loss of sensation with these devices. Because of these concerns, these devices are rarely used. The use of means other than suturing to close a wound would significantly reduce the risk of suturing. These include staples, tape, tissue adhesive, hair apposition technique, or some combination of these such as tissue adhesive and skin tape. The hair apposition technique is one where the scalp hairs on either side of the wound are tied, closing the wound between them. Two Cochrane group studies compared these methods. One study compared adhesives and sutures. They found no difference in using skin glove and sutures when it comes to dehiscence, infection rate, physician satisfaction, or cosmetic results. The second study compared adhesives and skin glue. In this study, the infection rate, cosmetic result, patient and physician satisfaction were fairly equivalent. In a comparison of tensile strength, sutures are the strongest, followed by staples, skin glue, and then skin tape. The advantages to sutures are that the wound edges can be approximated close together even when the wound is gaping or the wound edges are swollen. Sutures can be used for deep closure as well as layered closures. The disadvantages of sutures are the need for anesthetic and suture removal. Suturing also takes more time to perform than other closure methods. Staples can be applied fairly quickly with little skin irritation or infection risk. It is rarely used on the face, neck, hands or feet. 
Staples have to be removed, which may cause discomfort, especially in kids. Some question the cosmetic results in comparison to suturing. In a study comparing sutures to staples, staples took less time and had a lower infection rate, but were considered more painful. There are a couple of different skin tapes on the market. Taping a wound is good for superficial, well-approximated wounds. Skin tapes do not require anesthesia to apply, nor do they have to be removed. They can give added protection when used in combination with sutures or after the sutures are removed. Sutures are limited by the areas they can be used. Tape tends to come off easily, especially in moist skin or areas with sweat glands. The use of tincture of benzoin may help it stick. Patients need to avoid getting it wet. There is a higher rate of dehiscence if the wound is under a lot of tension. The skin adhesive or skin glue have the advantage of ease of application, no need for anesthesia, and quick application time. The glue does not need to be removed, and it forms a strong, flexible bond. It has some inherent antibacterial properties. It has an equivalent cosmetic, infection rate, and dehiscence rate to suturing. It is also a good alternative to suturing for episiotomies, nail bed repairs, and skin grafts. However, glue cannot be used around the eyes. If it gets into the eye, it causes glued eyelids and corneal abrasions. It has a low tensile strength. It is not useful for highly mobile areas like elbows and knees, high friction areas like hands and feet, or wounds needing exacting approximation. When the decision is made to suture, it is essential that it is performed safely. There are many keys to prevent injury to yourself or anyone else. Load, reposition, move and adjust the needle only with the needle holder. Never perform this with your hands or your fingers. You should never touch the needle. The needle, whether or not it is on a needle holder, is never passed from person to person. Rather, it is placed down in a safe spot and then the other person picks it up. Don't suture towards another person. When tying the sutures, don't tie the sutures while you're holding the needle. The needle needs to be placed on the sterile field prior to tying the knot. The needle should not be left in the field when done. The sharps go into a needle box. If the needle box is full, use another box or get a new box. An article in the medical literature describes this technique. A dermatologist described picking up the needle with the needle driver. Once the needle is through the skin, the needle is pulled out of the tissue with the tissue forceps, not with fingers. The tissue forceps is used to grip and reposition the needle back on the needle holder. If you need to move the needle around, the forceps is used to move the needle around on the needle holder. Once the procedure is complete, the needle is placed in the contaminated needle box and the needle is never touched. This is a video of the proper suture technique where the needle is never touched. The objective of this demonstration is to perform a simple interrupted stitch. This is really the basic suture technique used in all departments. Our volunteer, a pig's foot, is used to simulate suturing human tissue. The first step in the suturing process is to ensure that all of the equipment is at bedside, including suture material, tissue forceps, scissors, and a needle holder or suture driver. The wound is prepared for suturing by being irrigated and cleaning the tissue around it. Adequate skin anesthesia is essential prior to suturing. After the anesthesia has taken effect, the needle holder is used to pick up the suture needle from the package and the suture material is pulled out and adjusted with the tissue forceps. The needle should be placed about two-thirds of the way from the sharp end. If it is too close to the suture, the needle is at risk for breaking or bending. If it is too close to the sharp end, it may not go through all the tissue. The needle holder is held with your ring finger and your thumb using your index finger as the guide. The suture should be placed the same distance from the edge of the wound, same depth on both sides and perpendicular to the wound. In order to properly approximate the edges, the tissue is elevated with the tissue forceps on one side at a time. The needle is put through the tissue on one side and then on the other side with the same distance and same depth as done on the prior side. Once through the tissue, the needle holder is used to pull your needle through the tissue, leaving a small amount of suture material and avoiding anyone close by. It is important to leave about a centimeter or so of suture material on the other end. The needle is dropped onto the sterile field. A square knot is used to tie the suture. To make a square knot, you go over the first time, grab the short end, and pull it through. Sometimes you need to turn it a little bit so it stays tight. The next time you go under the thread, grab the short end, and pull that through. You may put additional throws in if you are concerned that the suture knot may slip. The scissors are used to cut the thread, about a centimeter or so. 
This is done so that it is long enough so that you can pick it up when you do your suture removal, but not too long that it's getting in the way of your next suture. For the next suture, the needle is grabbed with the needle holder. The forceps are used to help you adjust the needle, placing it in the proper position. Repeat the technique. Now we are going to focus on suturing as part of a bedside procedure. Straight needles are routinely put in procedure trays for central line placement, arterial lines, and chest tubes. It is uncertain why they have straight needles, but straight needles are used to secure the line to the skin. Many times procedures are done under duress where time is a significant element and the suturing is very hurried. Suturing the straight needle is done without instruments. Since these procedures are done without instruments, it is high risk for a needle injury. No answer could be found for placing suture needles exclusively in procedure trays. Staples, tape, or skin glue can be used to secure the line or tube to the skin. In 2010, 30% of our needle sticks were suture sticks, and of that 30%, one third of the suture sticks resulted from a straight needle stick. The solution was easy. Replace all the trays with needle holders, forceps, and curved needles. However, it was not an easy solution because manufacturers charge a much higher rate to remove the straight needle and replace them with suture material, a needle holder, and forceps. Instead, a packet containing a needle holder, suture material, and a forceps were placed on every procedure tray. It was also mandated, institution-wide, that this kit must be used instead of the straight needle. We have not seen a recurrence of needle stick injuries from straight needles since the implementation of this procedure. Hopefully, one day manufacturers will remove the straight needles from the procedure trays altogether. Even better would be the removal of all suture devices with the addition of staples or skin glue. Even using the best technique and proper equipment advocated in this presentation, an exposure may occur. The first thing that is needed is to wash the wound with soap and water, followed by obtaining immediate medical attention. Especially in potential exposure to HIV, treatment must be started within the first two hours. It is important to report to the emergency department or go to employee health and get that evaluation and treatment right away. Both the source of the exposure and the caregiver need testing for presence of disease. It is essential that all exposures are reported and tracked. Underreporting of exposures is a significant problem because many caregivers do not want to report for various reasons. We found many of the unreported exposures by investigating the orders for the source panel and tracking back to determine who was exposed. The manager, clinical chair, site director, or residency director questions the exposed person as to what technique and equipment was used. Institutions trend all needle sticks. Managers use this trending information to make changes in processes or equipment, education needs of the staff, and to monitor exposed individuals' subsequent behavior. The most important take-home points from this talk are that you need to double glove and you need to consider other skin closure techniques when evaluating a wound. Also, if you choose to suture, do not ever touch the needle. Use a needle holder and tissue forceps to adjust the needle. Remove all the straight needles from procedure trays and replace them with needle holders and curved needles. If a needle stick occurs, obtain medical care in the emergency department or employee health as soon as possible. We hope you found this presentation valuable and that it helps you create a safer environment when closing a wound. Thank you.